What's up, Maki fans? Thank you for joining our second of four live web series all about the Mustang Mach-E. We're going to be focusing today on Sync 4A and the fantastic technology that comes with your vehicle. Um, we have two fantastic speakers ahead of us that I'm very excited to introduce. The first is Darren Palmer. He is Ford's global head of product development for battery electric vehicles. And the second is Hussein Dekrub, and he is our technical software program manager for Sync 4A. Both of them are some of my favorite folks within Ford's Team Medicine and also experts in the field that they're in. So I'm really excited to kick things off. As a reminder, we are going to be recording this live and it will be posted to Ford's YouTube channel in the coming days. And we will be answering Q&A live through the chat function. We've got a couple Ford experts on hand to make sure we can answer those questions as quickly as possible for you. And I hope everyone can learn something today and have some fun. So Darren, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Thank you. So I'm so happy that we're able to speak to you tonight. This is a, a very special product, and you are the people who have supported us with reservations of this vehicle. And I can tell you, you're going to be very happy. The world is only just seeing what this vehicle can do. In my 29 years of developing vehicles and launching Mustang, actually, and in some regions, I don't think I've seen a vehicle that's had a better reaction to this when we take it out on the road. We're currently in the final testing now, and every other few days, we're handing back the car and going back to our ordinary cars, and none of us want to hand back our car each time it happens. But tonight, we're here to talk about the um, Sync 4A system, the human-machine interface of this car, and it's really the heart of this car, and the story about how that was developed. It, it's developed in a way we've never done in any car we've ever had, um, and we wanted the real people that did that development to be able to talk to you and answer your questions. Now, I've got to tell you, we, when we started this car, we believed we need to make a new type of HMI on this vehicle that's very easy to use. And we used a new method called human-centric development to do this. And that gets you out and testing with real customers really early on. So it started off being it's a new HMI and must work really uh, pro proactively and really simply but it ended up something completely different. It ended up a system that gets to know you. It's personalized to you. It has all of your content, your apps, simultaneously with zero learning curve. We believe it's the best system on the market. We may be slightly biased, and we don't think there's anything like it similar. So we're absolutely delighted to share with you the story of how it was developed, and also show you a few more uh, tips and tricks behind how it works. So first, I'd like to introduce Hussein, who led up our software development team during this process. Hussein. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Hussein. I was part of an amazing team that uh, brought you um, this next generation sync. Um, so today, we'll, we're going to talk a little about the background, our thought process on um, uh, the, the system and what we wanted to accomplish. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, throughout the, from the beginning, uh, how it all started, uh, we wanted to kind of deliver something that's unique and new uh, for our Maki customers. Uh, we wanted to rethink everything from the ground up. What are our customers using our system for in our daily drive, uh, in their daily drive, and what are they trying to address? So we uh, kind of, the, for just from a process perspective, we were looking to be a little more iterative where we were thinking about certain designs, um, we were looking at certain experiences, and at the same time, we had customers uh, from around the country um, kind of uh, utilizing these systems. Um, as, as we prototype them, we uh, hand them off to kind of customer clinics, and we directly uh, get their feedback. So uh, kind of the pictures here, you're seeing uh, kind of behind the scenes, um, uh, when our management, when Darren and, and our management wanted to uh, come up with this new concept, we, we brought the entire team together. So amazing team members from our studio, our HMI team, and also our software development team. And we all sat in this uh, kind of abandoned little room in the back of a building uh, that was kind of the only place that fits all of us. And we started to really um, rethink uh, what an HMI uh, should be. So here you'll see a funny image from Darren uh, kind of playing with the physical knob uh, that ended up uh, kind of making it into production. 
Um, but again, one of the one of the main things that we wanted to accomplish and we did um, during this iterative phase and, and um, when we were trying to come up with the experience was meet with real customers, uh, potential EV customers, and try to, to derive exactly what they want. So we actually had a live feed um, directly into a few areas in the U.S., one of them being Chicago. And we were kind of beaming in prototypes and iterating in front of the customer um, while we, we were here in Dearborn. Uh, taking notes, uh, throwing them on the wall, seeing what customers are seeing about the system. And uh, a few times Darren walked in. What do you think about that, Darren, when you walked in with all those sticky notes and kind of the live feed and out of Chicago? Yeah, it's, I mean, the what, what we said was before we, we, we said, we want to develop a next generation HMI system that is a huge leap in front of anything else that's in the market. And how would we do that? And um, one of the developers said, not working the way we work. And we said, all right, we're listening. Okay, ha ha working how then? They said, well, you have to do it like, like they're doing Cupertino. You have to give the developers space, the resources they need, direct access to customers, and a whole lot of pizza and coffee. And, and we'll, we'll work out how to do this, get out of our way. And we said, well, okay, well, we're, we're willing to try something completely differently. So that's why we found a space, as Hussein said, it was an empty warehouse space. We put the team in and we just cleared the deck for them every day of what they need. So it was the, the development team that drove this. And they quickly drove to, we need to go and prototype and we need to get customer feedback immediately. And how will we do that? And one of the team members, it was to, um, Tom there on the right, um, said, well, if we make a HTML5 screen of this i can go and test it with customers next week and so they did and a couple of nights they spent up late they stayed up late and they started programming some interfaces different types and then they went to test within a couple of weeks and i walked in one one of the evening sessions and they live streamed from a customer feedback um session where the customers are trying out the system the development team are watching and as the customer gets caught on something they're changing the code live, pressing refresh, re radioing through to the um, moderator and changing the system the customers were using. Try that. And then watching customers, did that work for you? Didn't it? What worked? And then they would stop. And then the next day they would um, put together, what have we learned? What did we see? What seems to be working? And, and so on. Yeah, there was, there was many um, learning experiences. Uh, I mean, one I remember... Um, eventually when everyone gets, gets in the vehicle and sees the system, uh, we have kind of this uh, notion of uh, kind of the applications drawer and also the settings drawer where the application is more for your applications, your profile, and also um, kind of the setting or control drawer to go and access vehicle functions. And um, originally the original prototype um, kind of had those in a single location. Um, and we kind of show it, we, we give you some glimpses in, in the next few slides where um, it, originally we had them combined in a single location and then kind of that customer feedback came back. They're like, Hey, we want, you know, quick access to our controls. We want it first surface so we can access it quickly. And we were kind of jotting down those notes. So you see there that big TV, um, you kind of see half of it. There was actually a live feed, uh, of, of customers and we were feeding in prototypes and, um, we were getting feedback of what customers would like and what was actually um, how, how, how they were using it. So we weren't like only directly looking for customers to tell us exactly what they want. We, we were observing physically how customers are using the system. And we look at where they're struggling and we looked at uh, what's actually working and we iterated on that. And uh, we did sprints of two to three weeks where we would create a complete uh, new um, a part of the prototype, and we would beam it down to uh, our partners uh, with that are sitting with customers, and they would test them out. And then every two to three weeks, we would we would build, build, and build on it. And this kind of prototyping exercise took us roughly ninety days, and we had kind of a complete uh, prototype that um, we got buy-in from everyone around the company. That everyone kind of rallied behind it; was really excited. Uh, we had an amazing team from design led by Peter Ruthenberg. Uh, we had amazing team members from the HMI team with Paul Aldegheri, Mohammed, 
um, and, and Mike. So we had a few of our top experts in the company huddle up in the space that you guys are seeing here and just start prototyping, building something customers really want. Um, kind of our, our image of what we wanted, as Darren already mentioned earlier, something next generation. Um, so you look at kind of handheld devices, smartphone these days, um, they're very uh, intuitive, next gen from a design aesthetic perspective, they're appealing. You visually want to grab them, you want to interact with them. And we looked in the field, um, in automotive, things were a little more traditional in terms of design and interaction. We wanted, again, to develop something next gen. So you'll notice on the next slide. Oh, one uh, one yeah. thing to say, so some of the myths that we dispelled for ourselves, we, we thought, well, phones and tablets are very swipey, so maybe you need yeah. to swipe. So some of the concepts had a lot of swiping in it. And it was yeah. only when we started testing it with real customers and, and frankly putting them in a car and seeing how it feels when you drive, we realized, yeah, swiping's good when you're looking at the screen, but you're yeah. driving a car. You're not supposed to be looking at yeah. the screen. And it doesn't work for that. So, so we, those ones didn't work at all, and we put them aside. And another one we were trying, you know, everybody was talking about, you know, I just want to get to the volume control easily. And so we ended up with this physical volume control. And you saw it in one of the other pictures. We said, what if? And we put, we, we had a swivel control. We put it on a TV, started using it, and we tested that quickly. And everybody loved, everybody loved the physical control knob. And so we went seeking for some new technology that would allow us to put the control knob bonded to the screen. Um, not as most traditional cars separate. And so it's actually bonded to onto the screen and you can see through that control knob and it uses a certain technology. It's not wired to the screen. The screen detects the control knob. And when we tested that, people went crazy for it. So because you now got a combination of physical control and touchscreen. I, I think the, some of the funnest memories I have of, of developing this is the discussions. Uh, um, I, I would say um, yeah, very good intended uh, uh, discussions before everyone had a perspective. Um, everyone was trying to bring in a fresh new perspective. What, how can we build the best uh, looking and usable infotainment system, as Darren was mentioning. Um, kind of some brought a perspective of bringing in more animation, um, more swiping, uh, more advanced UI interactions. And th at the same time, we had experts on, on our team that's specifically looking into automotive utilization. So when you're driving and your fingers on the screen, you want to interact with something quickly or you want to be able to swipe it quickly and move on. Kind of the whole goal of the infotainment system is to kind of help you reach your destination in, in an easier um, uh, method. So, one of one of the early memories I, I have of of back in the room was around um, kind of the, the the swiping between different applications, and we took it to customers. And what what was cool about this process is customers sometimes uh, broke the tiebreaker, and we were looking at it live. And uh, we would uh, kind of joke about it um, uh, between us. So um, here we're looking at kind of an early, very early prototype um, of just a mock UI of how we wanted things to be kind of placed on the screen. And you'll eventually in later slides see how it evolves. But this is kind of an early uh, look and feel uh, when we were sending this out to customers and seeing just from a concept perspective, is this what you like? Um, and kind of the core principles that we were trying to head on was, again, a very, a very modern visual looking UI that's visually appealing and also something that's intuitive, uh, but at the same time, um, something fresh, new and personalized. So you'll notice on the next slide, we'll go through uh, kind of in depth uh, some of the aspects of uh, our modern HMI and our, our um, kind of uh, interaction and whatnot. So here with what we, what we were trying to accomplish, as, as you notice here, our design team did a fantastic job with bringing in a fresh new theme. Um, again, this is sometimes things that um, are brushed to the side when building an overall vehicle. Uh, uh, automotive companies traditionally are looking to invest in certain areas. But now, I mean, with this new age, software is important. And uh, 
what do, what do you think, Darren, um, about kind of the, the theming part of it? I know that's one thing that you really pushed us hard on, kind of a modern theme and modern UI. Yeah, so, um, so another one of the things we learned as we went was um, we were looking at what do people want? And we started to, oh, you know, um, I want certain things on the screen. And then we speak to the next person and they want something different and the next person something different. So the realization was, people, I want my stuff. Trouble is everybody's stuff is different. And so one of the principles of the system is that you see the main screen there at the top and there's these cards. As you use it, the things you use most will move to the top. And after we find after about an hour, all of the things that you commonly use will be at the front. And you'll notice that the cards at the bottom are still usable. So while you have nav up, you can answer a phone call, mute the call, or even call key contacts. And you can also change the radio stations or the or select the music or the audio or one of the streaming services without taking the main nav off the screen. If you want to go deeper, you can just touch the card at the bottom, it expands, and then you, you're deeper into that item. And, and something else people loved is the navigation. Full screen navigation on a 15 and a half inch screen is a beautiful thing. And it has graphics of all the buildings as well. It looks beautiful. So a lot of us, as we use this system, we find we, we maximize the nav and we're running there. And then we can still use phone calls, changing radio stations and so on at the same time. I remember, the key. I remember Darren, when you took us into uh, one of the hidden labs where the vehicle prototype was, um, right when we were building this HMI and you're like, look at this. And that was the, kind of the first time many of us seen it and we're like, wow, this is a great looking vehicle. And we're like, we got to ensure the interior and the, and the display matches that level of um, kind of uh, beautiful looking vehicle from the exterior. It turns heads. Uh, when, when we're driving this day, everyone stops like, hey, what is this? How can I get it? So that's kind of, we got jealous. We're like, hey, we want the interior to be the same way. We want people to get in the vehicle and be like, hey, I, I, I want one just like that. So it's... Um, it was definitely an, uh, a great adventure with um, our, our collective team, and I believe we did an amazing job of bringing in a modern interface. On the, on the next slide, um, we kind of show uh, a little more on the personalization aspect of things. And here I took raw videos from our vehicle um, showing some aspects um, of how you can customize things and whatnot. Uh, on, on the uh, on the left side, um, uh, if we go to the next one, we'll, we'll, we'll show right here abilities just to create a um, profile. Um, if we can go a step back, we, we we show the ability to create a profile. So as customers, you'll be able to create a profile, save the many settings uh, that you have in the vehicle to that profile. So just by creating the profile, everything you already have in the settings automatically links to that profile. And as you create a, a different profile, so if Darren comes in the vehicle and he starts adjusting his settings, it's automatically getting saved to his profile. And then you can save the kind of the profile both to your uh, fob, to your phone, and as you're approaching uh, the vehicle, it automatically tunes up everything to your profile and your liking. So I always know when Darren drove the vehicle before me, uh, as I'm getting in, it starts sliding from five feet back and uh, he's, he's six foot eight or six foot nine. So it starts to slide up to, to my profile. That gets bigger every time you say it. I'm six <laughs> feet. But, um, but yeah, so I mean, it's a fundamental of the car that it, what we, we learned as we did this is all about it adjusting to you. So when you walk up to this car, the phone is the key. Your phone is the key. It already loads your profile in. The electronic door lock system feeds the door to you. You open it with one finger, sit down, and it's already set to your profile. All of your settings, your radio stations, your favorite teams, the position of the uh, seats, um, the heating controls, the temperature, everything's set to you. Um, and, of course, it can be set to other members of your family as well. Um, you can even put your photograph in here, which is uh, something we thought was really important to personalize it for you. You can choose your own or you can choose uh, avatars there as well. Um, and that and that's the key. And and the thing I love most about the system is that um, you can also use CarPlay and Android Auto. And 
and we mean simultaneously with all of the other car systems. I may be asking Hussein as he's talking through this to tell you about how that system works with this car as well. Yep. Yeah, we'll we'll touch upon that in, in a few slides. But um, one 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 thing, as as Darren mentioned, we're looking to provide customers with um, kind of a adaptive experience to what they want. And if we go to the next slide, um, here I'll, I'll, we'll talk a little about uh, cloud, our cloud connectivity within the system. So the system Sync Four in general was redesigned from the ground up to take uh, full advantage uh, of our high-speed connectivity in the vehicle. Um, so one, one of the baselines of this vehicle is that it has to be connected. Um, we have to have uh, real live traffic data uh, hitting the vehicle. Um, so we're, we've partnered with some amazing companies to bring on um, live traffic data, live uh, routing, uh, cloud-based routing. So when you enter a route, we have uh, back-end systems calculating and beaming right into the vehicle uh, to ensure we're capturing from and, and computing from billions of, of uh, data points. So again, the, I think this is one of the most fundamental and important aspects of the vehicle. And you'll notice on the right, uh, the digital assistant. Um, again, something we really wanted was something very natural, being able to speak to the vehicle very naturally without having this segmented um, way that typical infotainment systems had. So one of the, the things the amazing voice team brought in was natural language. So now you can easily just say, you know, take me to Laguna Beach or, hey, uh, I need some Tylenol or uh, take me to Disney World. And it automatically brings you these uh, destinations. So it's, uh, as Darren pointed, navigation, you can expand it and, and make it uh, kind of the, the full screen as kind of those evening moments when you're just returning home and you just want the nav screen up and that's all you're focused on. So uh, it's, it's very adaptive. And uh, as our customers get to this, they're, they're going to love some of these uh, features as they get used to them. Yeah, I mean... Um... I mean, really, we should say during the development of this system that it was this team, the software development team that said the screen is too small and we, we had a smaller screen in the car. And yes. they said, you need, you need to go and get a bigger screen because the ambitions we've got for this interface will not fit on a, a small sideways screen. Um, and, and, and so we went and sourced this one and we changed over during the development of the vehicle. And, and we've got to say, it's addictive. We've, the minute you open the door of that car, everybody, and I mean, we must have had six or 700 people sitting there. Everybody is obsessed by the screen immediately and starts playing with it. And 20 minutes later, they look up at the rest of the car. So it, 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 it's the heart of, heart of the vehicle. And um, full screen nav running is addictive. It, it, all of us, we run with this the whole time. And you can add, uh, add on extra information. You can see that info window there you can add traffic and alerts or you can add food stops or you can add weather and it does the radar for the weather and all sorts of things and the forecast going further out you can add extra information to that screen just by clicking one of the bottom buttons at the bottom and it's fantastic so you can have what what you want on, on that screen and yeah and uh, in addition to that in the next slide you'll see um um to the earlier point of uh, what Darren was getting into with uh, CarPlay. So here you'll notice wireless CarPlay running. Uh, but the way we look at it is uh, it's the customer's choice. So it's uh, if you notice a lot of the infotainment systems today, when you open CarPlay or Android Auto, it takes over the entire screen. Um, so we wanted our experience um, to um, also be um, reachable. Uh, we wanted uh, CarPlay and Android Auto to be an app within our system as well. Uh, we wanted to leave it to the customer to kind of live in either world. If you notice here in the video, you'll be able to have, you know, um, navigation in CarPlay to listen to radio, flip between the two if you want to. You can also be listening to, mu uh, to music of your applications within CarPlay or Android Auto and uh, be able to use our embedded navigation. Um, which we really worked hard to uh, bring in some great user experiences and, and features within our navigation. So again, this is giving the customer the choice of what do you want to use? Do you want to use our digital assistant? Do you want to use Apple's digital assistant? Do you want to use Google's digital assistant? So there's several ways we left it to the customer. 
Yeah, so so one thing, you know, we asked ourselves, so why should I use one or the or the in-car system? We found we found ourselves we use both. So we we bring Android Auto or CarPlay up. By the way, it also shows the navigation on the main cluster when you're using Android Auto. I've never seen that on a car. So when you set in ways your route, for example, is giving you the arrows and the um, guidance also on your cluster as well. And then, but then you just want one touch of the card and it brings you into the navigation system that's built into the vehicle. And for example, I was tending to use, everybody's different. I, I was tending to use Waze for journeys because it gives me so much information along the way. But as soon as I want to find charging, we have built in all of the information about charging into the main navigation system. So you can find one of the 13 and a half thousand chargers and all the information about that charger um, just by going into our nav system. So I tended to use that one more whenever I wanted to uh, find charging solutions and ones that are on the network. And of course, we announced that we've put together the biggest network in in, uh, in the US with over 13 and a half thousand charge stations. Yeah, and, and while again, you're using these two applications or whatever application you're using, one of the biggest value as our customers gave us feedback on is we have a persistent climate there. So you can always change the climate one touch away, it's not hidden. And uh, again, the, the, the amazing physical knob uh, for those moments where you just want to higher lower the volume as you're using some of the apps. So everything first surface, uh, quick access uh, has been evaluated. Kind of on the next slide, we, we dive into um, show you guys some of the uh, OTA updates. And one of the founding principles of the system is the ability to continuously improve, adapt. Um, so as customers, you'll be able to schedule updates, schedule specific times where you want the vehicle to download the updates and on the next ignition cycle you're, you're up and ready to go so um you, you'll notice as as uh, customers drive off or receive their vehicles um you know the vehicle is going to get better over time with continuous improvements some cool little features that you'll notice can't share with them with you guys here uh some that i already showed darren and others uh they were excited about but um again I think this is this is one area where we didn't compromise, right, Darren? I, I, I think this was um, one of the core principles of what we want to accomplish with with the system. Absolutely. I mean, every single module on this car is over the air updatable, and we use an AB swap system as well. So because if if you download an update on a lot of devices and it starts and it fails, it can leave the device inoperative. This car, every single device, it downloads first. And then when you power, it cycles across and switches to the new. And if anything happens any time in the vehicle life, it reverts back to what it's got. So it will never leave you uh, stranded or in a difficult position. Yep. But particularly this system, of course, we're, we're planning many updates. This is just the first go. And I see on the chat talk that what else can we do with that control knob? And yes, of course, you're right. We're starting with volume, as everybody wants that. But that has a lot of potential of things we can do with it. And as Hussein said, we've already got some ideas. And we'll be delivering you new content uh, throughout the whole ownership of the vehicle. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this kind of ho hopefully gave you guys some insight of uh, what we did behind the scenes and um, what our thought process was uh, working on the system and what we want to accomplish and kind of give you some um, uh, visuals directly off the vehicle. So I think now we can potentially open for uh, questions and answers if we go to the next uh, couple of slides. Yeah, there's some really great ones, and um, a lot of people are asking about does it does it do certain fu features and functions, and pretty much almost everything I've read, yes, it does. So, um, so okay, let's get on to our questions. Yeah, so I'm here for you guys. Yeah. Um, I have them organized into a couple different threads. Um, some great participation. Thank you, everybody. I think we'll start with just general Sync 4A questions. Um, Scott, Scott, and several others wanted to know the main difference between Sync Three and the new Sync Four A. Yeah, a great question. I mean, w one of the main changes is um, the system's always connected. Um, uh, it's, it was kind of redesigned from the ground up. A lot of the features are built around uh, getting access to uh, different data points. Like, for example, in navigation, you have traffic, live traffic data, live uh, cloud routing. Uh, within the digital assistant, uh, you're always uh, gathering the database from the cloud, so you're always up to date 
when you're interacting with um, um, kind of the digital assistant. Also, we have uh, IP streaming with the uh, SiriusXM 360L on-demand shows. Uh, we got wireless CarPlay Android Auto. So you just have to get in the vehicle, throw your phone on the wireless charger. No need to plug it in. Um, connect it over Wi-Fi. Um, again, one of the main things that we've shown here is, is kind of a beautiful, fun-to-use interface. Um, I, and I think customers are, are, are going to love it. I would say from a customer point of view, Sync 3, it feels like a car. And it has a certain amount of functionality. And this system feels like a, a modern connected device, like a phone or a tablet or something like that. It feels like a completely different type of interface. And Darren, Patrick and Krishna both have the same question. Um, so say if, the, if, if you get in the car with your wife, for example, and you're both connected, how do they know who's who for driver customization? Yeah, I, I can chime in on that one. Uh, the way it works is, as, as customers are walking up to the vehicle or if someone's walking the vehicle, whoever's entering from the driver's side of the door, we know it's done. Um, uh, it's kind of the, I don't want to dive in too much technicality, but the, the way some things are built in the vehicle, we know who's coming in from the driver's side of the vehicle, and then the, the system would adapt to them. So per, per their key fob or their phone, um, so that's that's one way we know who's coming in from the driver and we load that specific profile. So if the wife's coming in or the husband are coming in from the passenger side, um, we're picking up the driver's side so they don't, have, they don't have to worry. Yeah, And if you ever wanted the other one or it got it wrong for some reason, it's like Netflix. You just click profile, pick the other picture, and it flips over. Perfect. Uh, we also got a lot of questions about um, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, and several people, like Benjamin, just want to know why our system, why we think our system's stronger, or how we decided to uh, to either give folks choice, or or why we think we have a leg up. One of um, a very good question. I mean, obviously, there's ecosystems that bring uh, some powerful attributes. Um, and some customers prefer, you know, they, they want to live in something they're used to that they use on a daily basis. And we're not denying that. But one, one of the main things why we, I believe we have an advantage where the system's connected to the vehicle and connected to the cloud. We know how uh, the current uh, weather and also how the current the driving habits are, like how you're currently driving. Um, if you're accelerating more than um, usual or whatnot, we can be able to calculate exactly when you need a charge and help you out. Um, so there's certain things that uh, other um, uh, brought in devices don't have access to that we have within our embedded navigation that we can help the, the user with. And also our digital assistant has access to, for example, a like climate function. So as you're driving, you can just say, hey, set it to 32 or 60 degrees or set it to 80 degrees or 20 Celsius. So there's uh, certain things that you can do with uh, the, the features that are available on, on the vehicle. Uh, on the embedded uh, side of the system. And then there are certain things that, hey, if customer wants to bring in an app or two from Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, while we'll use our amazing new cloud-connected uh, uh, navigation system, they'll be able to. Uh, we're, I think we're, we're very open to keeping it to the customer to make that choice. We didn't want to lock anyone out from what they're used to or what they enjoy. Um, for me, it's it like all of the best HMI systems in the world, and that it's layered. So for somebody coming to it for the very first time um, who may have been intimidated by some system, they, they only need to know two things, and that is all settings for the car are in the little car on the top left, which when you touch it, it beautifully moves forward and the lights come on, with a little tip I, I love. But all settings for the car are there. They're not spread out among the cluster of the car or you're just in one place. So if you're looking for something, just browse down the list. And then anything to do with your own app is in the center with probably your picture on it. And that's all you need to learn. The rest of it takes care of itself. And I've, we've watched all different ages of people with all different experience be able to use it immediately. And it's all clear, good size text. So it, it makes everybody comfortable. And then as you get used to it, you can really make it sing to what you want. Some users will use CarPlay or Android Auto and they'll run 
their apps there and they'll choose it'll automatically choose the top three cards that they're using the most and some people will just use the basics and put the radio on it doesn't matter it will adapt to you and that's what i love most about it it doesn't prescribe how you have to behave it lets everybody have what they want perfect um Back to navigation, Bill, Randy, and Jared, and a couple others have been asking um, if navigation comes standard or if it's a subscription service, as well as if there's any other subscription costs to keep using the built-in nav. Yeah, so um, the, the navigation's on um, all trend levels, so all customers will get navigation from the get-go. Um, in terms of subscriptions, I believe more details will be coming to our customers um, in potentially email and, and afterwards. Um, but as soon as you get in the vehicle, you don't have to worry about subscription. Everything will be there. Uh, but um, there'll, there'll be more information shared with our customers around subscriptions. and, and uh, Perfect. Um, and then I think you covered this, Usain, a couple times, but just to double clarify, several people have asked um, what happens if there is no 4 or 5G data available, how to kind of make sure that we can stay connected. So maybe we just yeah. it one more time. Yeah, so uh, that's one of our advantages of our system. Uh, the maps are embedded, um, so you can drive wherever you want, no connectivity, and you'll still get uh, uh, the latest downloaded maps when you were connected um, on on the vehicle. So you will have maps on the vehicle, you will have uh, turn by turn, you will have the digital assistant working. So there's the system will operate as intended uh, when you're not connected. There are some minor features or enhancements that uh, you might miss out on if you're not connected, but um, you will still get an amazing, great experience. And that's kind of what puts us a little um, separate than, than um, some of the uh, applications or that people are used to that are only connected. Perfect. Um, Jared wanted to know about Amazon Alexa integration. I'm not sure if you touched on this earlier, but maybe you could just talk about, about that as well. Um, we'll, we'll, it's, it's something we're, we're looking into and uh, it's something that uh, we'll, we'll have more information on and we'll be able to share with our customers in a future date. All right. Um, lots of interest around the screen, that big, beautiful screen. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, Barbara wants to know how, since that screen is so large, how we're accommodating for solar glare. Yeah, Darren, do you want to talk a little about, I personally don't know much about the, the roof of the vehicle, but it's heavily tinted, right? Uh, yeah, so, so Eddie, were you talking about the screen or the sunroof there? Talking about the screen to make sure there's no glare on the screen. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's something, um, a very important aspect of uh, screen adjustment and coatings. And uh, yep. we have a lot of requirements to make sure you don't get that glare off of the screen so it's not usable. So we, we, for one, the screen is coated. Um, it's positioned just right so that you do not get glare from the sunroof, which is huge, by the way. Um, and, um, and it works in all different um, um, light conditions. So it can, can yep. be light, the light theme, or it can be dark. And you can choose, of course, because that's our philosophy. Many of us, we love the dark theme and we leave it, we want it dark all the time. You can have it auto switching to uh, bright during the day and dark at night. Uh, but really, in the summer recently, even in the middle of the summer recently, we, we all had the system turned to, to a night theme. Yeah, and just to add a little on that, um, when we develop our HMI, we always ensure from a contrast perspective, we have labs uh, just built to ensure um, uh, some of the lighting aspects doesn't impact the, the, the visuals that are on the screen. So you'll notice the color contrast that our studio team chosen is, um, ensures customers always have uh, good visibility of the text and, and the icons and things on the screen. Uh, it's super bright. Right when I know you know you take it for granted, then you put your phone next to it, and you and it's brighter than your phone, so you realize how bright and high contrast the screen is. It's really nice. Great. And then uh, John wants to know if you're able to rotate that uh, that screen, or if it needs to stay uh, up and down version. <laughs> good, good idea, but it's in portrait. 
Perfect. Um, and then Scott just asked, um, what about fingerprints? How did, how did you choose that glass and work with suppliers to make sure that the screen stays clear and visible? Yeah, again, we, we work with some amazing display, uh, display suppliers and they have, um, and we have an, 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 a, a team that are experts in displays at Ford. Uh, they do a good job ensuring all of these customer um, uh, pain points are met. And um, so I, I've been driving the vehicle for a while now. I, I haven't had an issue with uh, fingerprints on, on, on the display. And uh, of course, um, the, the displays themselves are very easy to also uh, wipe down, very similar to your phone or your uh, laptop screens. So. Yeah. Um, may I answer a question? I see a lot of questions about the charging infrastructure and what the screen does for you. That is something super important to us. So really, we tell the customer, you just don't worry about where you're going. Just load the route, either on your phone or in the car, and the car will automatically optimize the route and then find chargers that is in the network and prioritizing, of course, fast chargers and tell you where to stop and for how long. And then you'll be able to click on each one and see what facilities are available at that charging stop. Um, and if you don't like that stop, for some reason, you can change it for another one and the system will re-optimize again. The whole point being, all you need to do is worry about your family and everything else. Just put the destination in and the car does the rest. And that comes free with the car and it's with all of the vehicles. And it will update as charging stations are added. But even by next year, it will be the biggest network in America, um, even for the fastest chargers. And then it's just going to keep going from then on and the car will... Um, is always connected, so it will load the latest. Perfect. Um, John was asking to learn a little bit more about the thought process behind the, the knob on the screen and how unique that is. Um, Stern, do you want to dive in a little bit about that process? Yeah. And you have the customer in mind? Yeah, so uh, one thing we knew, we, we wanted to, we wanted the cockpit to be a little more advanced and, and, and digital. Um, but again, uh, we spent a lot of time benchmarking and listening to our customers. One thing we knew um, was people don't like uh, sitting there and tapping their volume up and down. So there's a lot of times when my kids in the back are screaming or you just want to lower it, talk to them and higher the volume, or you're kind of switching between uh, different audio tracks and you get excited by what's on the, uh, what's coming out of the speakers and you just want to blast it up. You don't want to sit there and yeah, obviously we got volume on the steering wheel, but it's nothing gives you that natural feel to easily uh, increase and um, lower the volume like a physical knob does. So we knew that customers would appreciate a physical feel to controlling controlling the volume up and down. So we ensured and we looked to engineer ways uh, to ensure the physical knob um, can can be bonded on the screen and still be util can can still be utilized for volume. So yeah. Um, so I see some questions here about the cluster as well, and we're not showing uh, the pictures of that today, but the vehicle has an information display in front of you. That was something that came across very, very strongly that people want. And that displays for you, the driver. And so it has everything you need. And in particular, the Copilot 360 system that is the self-drive, both hands-on and later hands-off, that system has a really well thought out interface that are able to convey to you when the vehicle is in semi-auto or into full auto. And we've tested that with all sorts of people with zero instructions to see how easily they can deal with that. And so again, that augments the system and gives you all the driver information you need. It even has things like, um, there's one mode, because some people are concerned about range and do I have enough range when I get somewhere? Can I get safely to home? It will show, the full range of the vehicle, and then your key locations like home. So with a visual look, you can see I have plenty of range. I, I, I don't even have to think about it um, because a lot of some people are nervous about that. And so that mode will, will show that to them. Yeah, and, and there's a couple of questions around how to activate the voice. Um, there's two ways. There's the steering wheel button. Um, to bring up the, the voice assistant. And also there's a wake-up word. Um, so you can turn it on and there's several wake-up wake up words that we have, wake words. Um, one of them is like, okay, Ford. And the system comes on and you can give it a command. So there's a couple of ways that we have it. And there's a couple of questions around um, uh, kind of uh, audio adjustments as you're driving. We have that as well. 
and the BNO system has been amazing. Audio system's amazing on the vehicle. So uh, it's, 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 it's definitely a fun ride, and the system itself is enjoyable as, as you're driving. I just saw that B&O one as well. I like the way you come on, guys. How's that B&O? I, I tell you, I hadn't realized fully, but of course, it's obvious. Electric cars are quieter, of course. So when you're on the freeway, um, you can talk at normal voice level to your partner, or we have this B&O soundbar, and it's been tuned with them. And because the car's so quiet, it sounds spectacular. That I get goosebumps every time I play certain tracks in that. And every time I get back in that vehicle, as I'm, we're doing test prototypes, the first thing I do is load music, start playing music. And at the moment, we're all locked down. When you can get out on the open road and start playing music in, in your Mustang, it feels really great. And just a reminder for everyone, next week's webisode will be all about interior design. So dive into that further. We'll talk all about the sound. And I know a couple of questions were also about the interior cabin. So we'll be able to answer that all next time. Um, a couple more general questions for us, uh, for our executives. Um, we'll talk about voice control. Um, a lot of questions about that. Darren Hussein, well, um, what exactly can do voice control? Austin asked if you can do control heat and AC by voice control. What's the story? Yeah, so you can definitely control the heat and, and AC. Um, you can uh, change your media. So you can, I, I always use this. I get in the vehicle and some other people have been using it and uh, uh, adjust to my profile. And then I just say, you know, tune to Sirs XM and the channel number. So very straightforward. That's how you would say it. Um, you can also make a call. So I just say call mom or call wife and it automatically picks it up just, just in that way. And then you can obviously give it a very simple uh, navigation um, uh, commands uh, like just take me home, take me to Disneyland, take me to Disney World. Or I don't want to give a little. We don't want to sponsor any place in particular, but uh, those are exciting places for me that I usually give an example to. But uh, again, you can even say find Italian restaurants in uh, Southeast Michigan or find Italian restaurants in Los Angeles. So again, there's there's many things that you can um, share with with uh, the system. And Darren and Hussein, do you want to talk quickly? I've got a couple questions also about phone is key and just that feature since it's new to new to, to new to Ford. Yeah, so we wanted the whole vehicle experience to feel really special from the start. So you may have noticed we announced we have a system where you'll get an app long before you get the car, and you can customize the car load if you want to load your key locations in your name, photo, all those things. And when you first approach the car, it will, un un you can pr the door will unlock and the car will prepare. Mustang appears on the ground, of course, from the mirror. And then you touch what it looks like, it feels like an iPhone button, and it feeds the door out to you. And I can't tell you how much, how nice that feels after a while. You end up in a very fluid motion of touching that handle and the car does the work. It breaks the door seal, pushes it open two or three inches, and then you can open it with one, one finger so that it feels special from the start. That's what the goal was. By the time you're sitting down, you haven't even thought about it anymore. By the time you're sitting down, your profile's loaded, you throw your phone onto the center console, it then wirelessly charges, and there's space for two because a lot of people have got two phones these days. And then really, it's the first car I've had where I don't need to touch the phone. Every other, I've tried and I try to not to touch the phone, but really I can't do everything I want without touching the phone. So, but this is the first car that you actually can. Uh, perfect. Um, and as always, uh, when we're talking about technology and connectivity, um, a couple of folks have asked about privacy and user data and what Ford is doing to make sure that um, with all the connected features of the great Mach-E, what we're doing to make sure people's data is safe. Yeah, so we we have an amazing um, security team at Ford. We have people that are experts at that. Um, I um, I personally uh, work with them. I don't I have in depth knowledge on the security portion of it, um, but we we have an we have a team that's uh, uh, experts in this. Ensure we're protected, um, and um, yeah. So not much to say on, on that, but 
it's uh, we have experts in our company that have a good idea of uh, how to keep things safe, um, how to keep things protected, and um, that's that's where we want to be with our customers. So. And with, with respect to privacy, um, that's something um, um, even from our chairman is extremely important to us. So we we will not be sharing your data without your permission. And there's many settings in the car where if you want to, you can control what the car does or does not record or what it does or does not share. And it's very, very clear. So um, whatever your personal preference is for those things uh, is in the vehicle. Um, we have two questions about um, Ford Pass and, and building off of the charging station questions. Darren and Hussein, um, they want to know if they should be utilizing Ford Pass or the in-car, in-vehicle um, screen to be looking up charging stations and locations. Can you repeat the question, Eddie? Yeah, um, we have two questions in about the um, identifying charging station locations and if we should be using the Ford Pass app on our phones or um, the screens. So I, I can share a couple of words that maybe Darren can take it, but uh, you can do both and you can even you start on your phone and send it to the vehicle as well. Um, you want to add anything, Darren? On top yeah, so I mean, it, it takes care of everything you need for the journey. So actually, if you, if you take Google or one of these systems at the moment and you try to use it to plan an EV journey, it's really a bit awkward at the moment and all of the networks are separate networks and, and we realized that and said we, we, this too, you can't have that for customers so that's why we negotiated to put together multiple networks so there's electrify america and there's other networks we've put together into one as far as you're concerned you don't care they're just in one and you search either on the phone or the car and it will find your route and the nearest charges and then you can investigate oh i only want fast charges over 100k well it'll, it'll list those for you or i want any charges so you can do that seamlessly and we have subscription to those included with the car so that when you get there um it's seamless uh, to to use charging and we'll also be bringing in plug and charge as the network expands to provide that so you just plug and walk away and everything else authorizes automatically it, that's what's and electrify america are the first people to do that and it's rolling out now then uh, Lori just asked, and we hope this never happens, Lori, but are there security features to disable the vehicle if it is stolen? Yeah, good, good question. Maybe we can circle back on that one, Eddie, but uh, we, we do have uh, things in the roadmap um, and, and things we're working on um, to address that, definitely. Um, we might have a lot more to share on it at a later date, so we can definitely circle back. Yeah, I mean, it, the car is a computer on wheels, so it, 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 anything you can think up, we, we can put in. Um, we have to be very careful with those type of things to make sure they're never misused in the wrong way. So, so you know, that's something we can do. It's, that's in our, in our roadmap. All right. And then I think we're, uh, we're just about coming up on time. Darren, and I'd love a couple last words for you about what you're, uh, what you're most proud of for the delivering the Sync 4A system. Let you go first, Hussein. Yeah, um, uh, I, I mean, one of the proudest thing I have is the, kind of the people I worked with uh, and and what we wanted to do for the for our customers. So we have an amazing team at Ford that really poured their hearts into this, and I really mean it. Um, stayed up nights and and uh, days and weeks, um, especially here and around Michigan, Canada, um, Europe. So we have team members from around the globe that contributed to this product, all for for serving our customers and for ensuring our customers have a great experience and a product. So I, I think that's something I cherish uh, most is working with the team to deliver an amazing product for our customers and. Um, Again, just uh, uh, working for for, for uh, the Blue Oval and what Ford stands for, I think uh, is, is something uh, um, that uh, we value, and our customers are going to see um, our our how we value our company is going to come out through our product. As they use our product, they're going to kind of get that same feeling. Everything they they touch, they're going to say, "Man, someone really thought of this." 
Uh, there's small, uh, nice uh, Easter eggs within within the screen, uh, closing out uh, cards, opening cards, stuff like that, that are not really there, but they're actually there. If, if you, uh, you, you get to use it, you'll, you'll notice it and you're going to be like, hey, man, someone really spent their time looking into this. And it's, it's an amazing team here uh, at Ford that really uh, dedicated uh, the past couple of years to deliver something very exciting for our customers. Um, for, for me, it's really what Hussein said. There's a huge amount of love put into this car. Every so often, a car comes along where you can see and you can feel it. And it's in the HMI all over the place, little things that you didn't even notice yet, you know, from touching the settings, the little car drives forward and the lights come on, to how it moves, little Easter eggs, things everywhere. And that's not just the HMI, it's all over the car. When you, when you own a product that's had that much love in it, it feels really special. So for me, the HMI system is just part of that. Um, and I said it at the beginning, if you have a reservation on this car, I think you are going to be really pleased with it. And I think as soon as they start hitting the dealers and people see them, if we get the reaction that we get every single time we take one out, I think um, they're going to be uh, sold out quite quickly. So if you have a reservation, congratulations. I'm very sure you're going to love it. All right. And there you have it. Uh, please tune in next week for our third episode all about interior design. And a big thank you to all of you for joining in. And a big thank you to uh, Darren and Hussein for, uh, for joining us as well. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Take care.